<clears throat> uh, good afternoon for everyone. Uh, I guess here in Brazil it's afternoon. I, I don't know where you are exactly, but uh, uh, okay. So my name is Daniel. I'm a PhD student at uh, Universidade de Brasília. Uh, I will be uh, the host of this section and uh, of this session and um, each presenter will have 15 minutes to present their paper and then uh, five minutes more uh, of discussion. Uh, we are beginning at uh, two o'clock, 2 p.m. 05. Um, and uh, the first paper, uh, I I'm going to read all the, the, uh, the uh, the program here, uh, but uh, the first paper that is going to be presented is uh, Entrepreneurship and the Cambridge Results, Schumpeter meets Passinetti, uh, which will be presented by João Ricardo Faria uh, from Florida Atlantic University. Uh, then a uh, theoretical note on the super multiplier approach in a labor constrained economy will be presented by uh, George Thompson uh, and João Gabriel. Uh, João Gabriel is from IBMEC and George is a, consult a consultant at the World Bank. Um, then uh, I will present um, a, a, a work that, uh, that is uh, in co-authorship with, uh, I am the co-author, <laughs> with João Gabriel and Beatriz Tulano Vieira. Um, and then informal economist contribution to middle income track, a collecting approach will be presented by Henrique Paiva. And then finally, a vertically integrated approach to structural decomposition analysis an analysis of the Brazilian economy from 2000 to 2018, uh, which is a paper uh, written by Ricardo Silva Zevedo Araújo and Tel Santini and Rafael Ciprestes. Um, okay, uh, I I would like to thank the presence of all of you. Uh, we are go we are already um, recording this session. Uh, it will be available um, at YouTube or another site. Um, we will provide that. And uh, I would like to ask for the first uh, for the first presentation to to begin. So, right. João Faria, the floor is yours. Okay, thank, thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Uh, 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 this this paper, the idea of this paper is quite simple. It's it's like uh, you see, there is a, a enormous literature about the robustness of the Cambridge result, right? Uh, but um, uh, I've never seen anything uh, uh, with regards to the uh, to the role played by entrepreneurs, and um, I, I find this very curious, uh, which I, I I I understand it as a shortcoming of the post-Canadian literature, the Caldo Pazinetti models, is that um, is that. Uh, the way that they consider the capitalists, uh, the whole of capitalists is quite mechanic. The capitalists just save and immediately savings trans uh, transformed into capital. All right. Uh, but then here, what I do is I consider capitalist uh, entrepreneurs a la Schumpeter. That is, uh, they they are responsible for technological innovations and a bunch of other, other important roles. Right. So what basically I do is, is to introduce the dynamics of uh, technological innovations into the, uh, into the Caldo Pazinetti uh, framework, right? Let's start from the beginning. You see the equation one is the savings of workers uh, corrected by Pazinetti from a mistake, a logical slip from Caldo. Caldo uh, consider, uh, didn't consider at the time uh, the whole of profits uh, accruing to workers, only the wages, and then the uh, Pazinetti corrected this. So this is the savings, total savings of workers. Total savings of capitalists is, is just a prop marginal propensity to save out of profits. Well, uh, in this very simple model, right, uh, Pazinetti proved that uh, 
Uh, the effective labor supply, when uh, measured in effective units, uh, it rises at a, a rate N, right? And uh, therefore, the steady state of profit and the interest rate equals N over SC, that is uh, the, 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 the growth divided by the marginal propensity to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to save of the capitalists, all right? So this is called a uh, uh, paradox, sometimes called Pazinet paradox, sometimes called Cambridge results, sometimes called Cambridge theorem, sometimes called Cambridge equation, whatever, right? But it's basically a paradox because uh, notwithstanding considering the whole of the savings by workers, it doesn't matter for the determination of the uh, for the, inter the equilibrium uh, profit rate of the economy. That is, it's irrelevant. This is a very surprising uh, result. OK. Uh, as I said in the beginning, the, 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 the main shortcoming that I examine here of the caldo uh models is to assume that capitalists just save part of their profits and invest it automatically and become like uh, additional capital, right? But of course, we know from this large entrepreneurship literature that is summarized by the textbook by Parker, Simon Parker has uh, the economics of entrepreneurship is a big volume published by the Cambridge University Press. It's in my in my my in my uh, references. Uh, you should have a look at this enormous uh, uh, textbook. Uh, he 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 says basically, you see, like entrepreneurs, they choose the appropriate technologies and make innovations. They combine uh, combine and manage technology with uh, human capital. They incorporate practical practical uh, knowledge. They find new business opportunities. They access credit. They invest bequests. Actually, in this uh, invest bequest, <laughs> I cited my paper with uh, a Chinese Wu. And now uh, uh, I need to talk about that because uh, it's based on George Thompson and Marco Antonio Martins model. It's a beautiful model uh, published in the Economics Letters and my paper was published in the Economics Letters as well. So read the Economics Letters and uh, the both papers, all right? Actually, you have to read everything from uh, Juanilio and uh, George Thompson. They are, they are the men. <laughs> Uh, in this paper, we we extend the caldo net uh, model uh, uh, with uh, neoclassical technology. That is, uh, I use the framework developed by uh, by Samuels and Modigliani classical paper, classic paper of 1996. All right, that was used also by Darity in the American Economic Review 1981 paper. All right, and in, in a couple of papers by one of my my only published paper with John Ely, uh, uh, in Manchester School. Right, what uh, basically what I do in this framework is, is to, in, to introduce the definition of innovations a la Schumpeter, right? I, and I'm not using the theory of uh, economic growth, the 1908 uh, initial book of uh, Schumpeter. I am using the business cycle book, right? 1939, um, it's a massive book, right? Um, very confusing book. But of course, there is some Schumpeterian light. And uh, basically, I, I take this, uh, this citation from Schumpeter. Technological change in the production of commu uh, what is uh, tech definition of innovation of last Schumpeter? They comprise technological change in the production of commodities already in use, the opening up of new markets and or new sources of supply tailorization of, uh, of work, improved handling of material, setting up of new business organizations, all right? And uh, basically, you can summarize all these activities, these entrepreneurial activities, Alain Schumpeter, with this sh short sentence that is very illuminating, very insightful, which is the following. Uh, innovations, are, uh, according to Schumpeter, is when entrepreneurs do things differently. That's it, right? So it's curious that um, one of the the, <laughs> the book reviews of this 
business cycle uh, business cycle uh, book of Schumpeter was made by Suisi. And there is an anecdotal uh, uh, an uh, uh, referring to Suisi and uh, Schumpeter and the Samuelson, because the Samuelson Suisse were students of um, of uh, of Schumpeter in the same class, and for the for the the great uh, disappointment of Samuelson, uh, Schumpeter thought that Swiss was <laughs> a much better student and a better economist. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So uh, here is the, the the baseline model, right? You you can see that uh, the only thing that I do in introducing innovations on Lausanne Pater is to update equations four, five, seven, and eight, right? Basically, the equation four is the uh, uh, neoclassical production function, and I put the the variable a which is uh, Schumpeterian innovations, all right? And therefore, the, uh, when you consider it in per capita terms, it appears in uh, equation five as a small cap A, all right? And uh, equation seven and eight are the, 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 the returns for capital and labor. Okay, so when we you use this basic counter passing setup, uh, uh, introducing the Schumpeterian innovations, we end up with these two differential equations, all right? These two basic saving investment equations for the two classes, one uh, investment for, for capitalists and one investment for workers, all right? Of course, the investment of the capitalists is what? Is a, a share of their profits. You see what, the part of the profits that they save it, they are going to invest in capital. And the same holds true for, for, for the workers. The, 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 the uh, marginal propensity to save of workers out of their income, which is the sum of wages and profits, right? So when I substitute, you see the, the, the profit here for the capitalist profit is RKC. And when I substitute R, it is the the marginal uh, the marginal return of uh, capital, all right, which depends on innovations. All right, I can transform these two equations into uh, uh, in per capita terms, all right. So uh, everything that is in small cap is in per capita terms. So what we have here is that we have the uh, growth rate of the population, and the small cap K is uh, capital per capita. All right, so I transformed the, the equations 9 and 10 in per capita terms. We have 11, 12, all right? And then we look at this system, uh, this dynamic system, and we ask ourselves, all right, so you introduced Schumpeter. Did Schumpeter meet uh, 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 Pazinetti? And the answer is no. Why no? Because, you see, this is a, 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 a system with two differential equations for three unknowns. All right, so it's missing a differential equation, okay? Because uh, uh, otherwise the, the system is undetermined. So we need a, a, a differential equation for the endogenous variable, the the small cap A, all right? The uh, uh, per capita innovations. Now I am going to take Schumpeter seriously, all right? What I'm going to do is the following. Do you remember that Schumpeter says that entrepreneurs do things differently, right? Which means the following. Innovations should be a function of entrepreneurial activity. So A is a function of E, right? Where E is the entrepreneurial activity. So if, uh, if uh, A is a function of, of entrepreneurship, right? The, the 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 differential equation for a is just the to differentiate this equation with, with respect to time and we have equation 13 all right so a dot is a function of e dot okay and now we need exactly to discuss the form the analytical form of this differential equation for uh, entrepreneurial activity over time right and here i am going to use the uh, uh, Schumpeter phrase that entrepreneurs do things differently. I understand this immediately as trial and error. That is, 
you are an entrepreneur, you try to 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 to, to obtain a result, make a new business, create a new product, whatever innovation you are trying to do. So you have a target. And therefore, that's the way I, I, I wrote equation 14, right? So this entrepreneurial activity is the uh, trial and error with regards to what? To a target, which is Y bar, okay? So I replace equation 14 into equation 13, and I derive what? The differential equation for Schumpeterian innovation, and I will just add it to into the caldo Pazinet framework that we saw uh, above. So we have equation 16, 17, 18, all right? In which I have equation 16 is the one that I just derived, and I consider equation 17 and 18, which are equations 11, 12, all right? So this is a system for uh, of three differential equations for three unknowns, all right? And therefore the system is determined. Now we just have to solve the system. When we solve the system, right, in steady state, that is, we, we equal each differential equation to zero, right? And therefore, we generate the steady state solution of the model. That is, Schumpeter uh, meets Pazinet. Uh, actually, Pazinet meets Schumpeter, right? So uh, here, what we have is like equation 19 is that in equilibrium, uh, entrepreneurial activity always what reaches their own uh, targets, right? When they reach their own target, this system, this dynamic system, is block recursive, which means the following: after the variable, the endogenous variable e, is determined, we can determine uh, uh, innovations a la Schumpeter, because innovations a la Schumpeter is that innovations is a function of entrepreneurial activity. So we determine what? Uh, the steady state of innovations that is a function of what? The target, all right? Where E star is equal to the target. And therefore, we replace this steady state solution into this, the two uh, uh, equations of uh, capital accumulation of uh, capitalists and, uh, and workers, right? And then rewriting, you see, rewriting equation 70. If you isolate FK, the return of capital, the interest rate or the profit rate, uh, according to the caldo Pazinet model, you have FK equals to what? A zero. Uh, this equation equals to zero. So FK equals what? N divided by SC. So N divided by FCC. But uh, FK is the steady state solution of what? of the profit rate of the economy. That is, that depends on the optimal activity of entrepreneurs. So that's it. Uh, 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 Pazinet meets Schumpeter, and what is the beauty of this result? Is that not of, you see, in spite of the fact that the uh, the rate of profit, the equilibrium rate of profit of the economy, being dependent on the equilibrium behavior of entrepreneurs, the main result of the model remains that the Cambridge result holds true. So, <laughs> all right. So. This adds this my result. This result it adds to this enormous literature. All right, here there are a bunch of papers by Joanili, by Araújo. All right, uh, these models that cover a number of issues uh, like open economy, public and monetary se uh, 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 sectors, introduction to micro foundations. According to yesterday's uh, lecture of uh, of Baranzini. All right, and uh, what is more important is that that lecture can be read as uh, this uh, paper published in, in, uh, in the, oops, uh, this uh, Baranzini and Mirante published in the Oxford Handbook of post Keynesian Economics, where he, he, he synthesized all that uh, 10, 10 uh, research, uh, uh, research topics for post Keynesian economics, all right? And uh, uh, so this is the 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 Barazzini paper that you should read. The the uh, the um, 
the Schumpeter book that I refer is this one, 1939 business cycle, right? It's man, this is this book is like uh, 1000 pages. He was like uh, not doing well in his head, right? And uh, some of the papers of Joanilio that I cite here are these two where uh, uh, Joanilio with George Thompson when Joanilio was the first author and there is also uh, um, uh, uh, other papers by Joanilio here, one with me, all right? And all right, and I've, uh, just to finish and for you that uh, have some curiosity about uh, because uh, I what I did in this paper was to investigate from the view uh, the relationship be between entrepreneurship and the uh, distribution of income uh, from the viewpoint of the post Keynesians. But you can do the, the reverse. You can go from from the literature on entrepreneurship and investigate how entrepreneurship might 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 determine um, uh, uh, the distribution of income. So the paper to be read is this paper of mine of uh, entrepreneurship and business cycles. All right, because I, there I develop a, a dynamic micro founded model in which I, I show how a Schumpeterian um, um, a Schumpeterian um, um, uh, entrepreneur uh, uh, affects the macroeconomy. So you go from micro to ma micro to macro, right? And this ends my presentation. Thank you for your attention, guys. Uh, thank you, Jean. Um, now I open for for the discussion. Uh, One of okay. Let, let me just say okay. We have if I have uh, something to say. Well, I, I discussed this model with um, with uh, uh, George Thompson, and um, one one of the important results is this one. Uh, the second most important result is this one. If you if you come here, right, uh, look at the equation, the the Cambridge equation R. Uh, uh, is equal to this uh, the marginal uh, the marginal re return of capital. If you di differentiate R with respect either to uh, innovations or to entrepreneurship, you are going to see that the 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 the, the, the derivative is positive. This leads us to one very important result for post Keynesianism, which is the following: it yields a mantra for free markets. And the mantra is more entrepreneurship, higher profits. Right? You see that there is a bias, a natural bias of the post Keynesian literature uh, in basically saying that, well, you no know, markets will not work very well, and therefore government is good. More government, more profits, right? Like the uh, national champions of uh, uh, Lula and, uh, and Dilma. But here, it's basically we say we don't need uh, we don't need government. We just need more entrepreneurs. So this is a, a reverse of fortunes for the post Keynesian. So I love it. <laughs> uh, OK, uh, I will I will try to 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 uh, I have a question uh, right. like this. This this last uh, result you you showed. Uh, what I know from Schumpeter is like uh, he he makes um, innovations uh, as a a break on the equilibrium point, and uh, I guess this is like um, uh, this is mm, yeah you this, are right. You this are is right. show this is showed in your this is shown. In your in your presentation and uh, in particular in your last uh, in your last uh, statement, uh, what I what I I want to ask you is that uh, you uh, you have to take into account uh, the costs of uh, entrepreneurship, like for yeah, example. Yeah. No, <laughs> you you are, you you are absolutely correct. But uh, to simplify and answer your question, Daniel, you see these uh, uh, these. Uh, uh, this this letter is epsilon, all right? Uh, uh, if my Greek is not <laughs> this epsilon, epsilon, this epsilon here, it, it can you can open this eyes uh, uh, and argue that it has to do with some costs, 
adjustment costs for mm -hmm. uh, entrepreneurial activity. But uh, I agree with you. Uh, one way, and this was the point that George was discussing with me, is like, uh, uh, Joca, uh, we need to open up equation 14 and equation 13, such as that we can incorporate very different uh, uh, modes of entrepreneurial activity, right? And then we 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 discuss it to write a paper together about that because that is a very promising uh, avenue of research, and I I agree with you, both of you. Yeah, um, uh, I, I just ask that because uh, I always think that uh, for innovation you have uh, costs that uh, that that come with a higher probability of not uh, not bringing any return. Yeah. This I have. Kind of stuff. I publish. I publish uh, uh, one year. Uh, one year ago, I published a paper in Energy Economics that um, uh, does exactly that. I put in a, into in a stochastic environment because you see, whenever you try an innovation, it may work and may not work. If it doesn't work, you lose money, right? That's exactly what you is your point. I did that in the and uh, the framework that I used was a Tobin Q. So I, I call that a, a green Tobin Q because I was talking about innovations in, in, in green technologies, which is in, in line with ESG and all the bullshit that uh, the World Bank uh, 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 makes us to, to think about. But uh, my, my point is exactly that, is that there is a, 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 there is a universe here, right? And for you guys that are thinking about writing papers, please, uh, go ahead and think about this because this is, you see, I made the most simple assumption in equation 14. Whatever you do, uh, uh, the assumption with regards to innovations and uh, entrepreneurial activity, it's welcome because it will, it will lead to very in interesting insights. Okay, uh, um, I open for our, uh, I think, Georgie. George Thompson raised his hand, and then João Gabriel. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, Jock, I think this is a very nice note, and uh, we, we, we had a chance to discuss that a little bit, and I, I really think it's it's um, it's promising. Um, now, the, the whole Schumpeterian thing is, is a bit tricky because it introduces uh, a lot of ideas, like the creative destruction, and the whole story of um, uh, introducing incentives for entrepreneurship, like for example, uh, uh, monopoly power is an incentive for for um, for uh, ent new entrants, right? New entrants want to get the, uh, 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 the the monopoly power and the uh, extra uh, uh, returns that come from it, right? So there's this whole uh, potential trade-off between competition and innovation that yeah, I mean but it would, would be nice to, to to sort of think about these things but I don't think that this is the main thing that I uh, in in the in light of this literature uh, the Cambridge literature that what I just mentioned is I don't think is the most important what what would be more interesting in terms of incentives for entrepreneurship would be to see if you can have uh, the profit expectations as an incentive for entrepreneurship, right? So you, you get R into the um, in, in R, R expected, ex, expect, expectation of R in equation 14, right? And then you don't have a block recursive system anymore, right? So you have a yeah. double sided relationship, which is a kind of because I, we, we know Joe Robinson has this do, double sided relationship between profits and um, an investment um, through this through profits expectation. So here you could have a Schumpeterian like double sided relationship between profits and entrepreneurship, right? Uh, one affecting the other. Uh, and then, of course, you'd have to define some kind of expectational rule, right? So how do you link? Uh, actual R with expected R. And so that, that's an idea that I threw in our uh, conversation. And, and that I think it's, uh, if you want to preserve like the sort of Monio Keynesian aspect of, of this model, that, that would be one way to go, right? Rather than go through the uh, Aguillon 
uh, route of putting creative destruction, monopoly power, and all that. But both avenues are actually open for extensions. Uh, but anyway, I, I think as it stands, the note is very good. Uh, uh, right? This this would be for follow up work. Yeah, yeah. But this uh, we are going to write a paper about that, uh, uh, George, because your your John Hobson uh, bridge is a, uh, is a very important one because it, 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 it of course it it cancels the the block recursiveness of the the model, but it adds the possibility of a much more interesting result, which is the possible existence of limit cycles yep. between yep. entrepreneurship and the rate of profit. And this is right. exactly, you know, like it is, is exact what is uh, the, the real dynamics of uh, entrepreneurship, right? right. And uh, I, I, only a genius like you to, to really to see this. And I, I, I fully appreciate it. What uh, I need to work a little bit more is exactly because I, I, I've been, you see, I, 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 I gained some fame on this, on this literature of uh, entrepreneurship because I was the only one to generate uh, cycles. Mm. So in, in, in all my papers in, on entrepreneurship, I publish a, a bunch of papers. Mo, mo, uh, um, the main result is to generate cycles. And I never came across to this idea that you just uh, that you just uh, pitch it. I, I, I really appreciate wonderful, wonderful insight. Let, let's we are going that. to write this. Let's we are going that. to write <laughs> Yeah, Gloria Eterna. Yeah, Gloria Eterna. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I have a comment and a question. Uh, Professor Joca, I'm sorry, but uh, Daniel and I are already working with cycles in John Hobson's model. All so right. we, we already... So, uh, so, uh, so I, got, I, ha I, ha I have to learn a lot out, uh, from you. Uh, it's going to be yeah. a pleasure. Yeah, we, we, we designed the model incorporating uh specialized and non-specialized uh wages for different type of peoples and uh, we already estimated the stability and uh, i also proved that we have a, a hop fabrication in this kind of model yeah. Yeah. uh i i only have a, 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 a one question here uh i read your paper with professor ricardo araujo published in the bulletin of economics i think uh, it is a paper incorporating some kind of neoclassical model into the Pazinetian model. And uh, I have to be fair, I don't understand how, I don't understood how uh, you two uh, incorporated a neoclassical productivity function into the Pazinetian model, because yeah. usually Pazinet works with a Leon Tef type of productivity function. And uh, this this work, this this paper, also do the same thing. You incorporated an neoclassical uh, Cobb Douglas uh, productivity function into the Pazinetian model. I uh, sorry for my naive question, but I, I really did not understand how to do that. All right. So what you have to do is to reread. Uh, some uh, Modigliani and Samuelson 1966 paper, right? Because they they their insight was the following: they they didn't want to generate uh, the Cambridge result. They wanted to generate the dual result, uh, an opposite result from the Cambridge result by using a neoclassical framework, right? So the whole motivation is there, and. Uh, but if you want to, of course, their their viewpoint is very anti post Keynesian. But you can also read the Darity. You see, uh, I'm going to show you Darity uh, here. I cite Darity. You see, simple analytics of uh, neoricardian growth and distribution. Yes. All right, this is also a paper uh, uh, that that uses the neoclassical framework, but from a very post Keynesian uh, author. So there, he he's, he's going also to 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 give you some good explanations why it would be useful to use uh, uh, the 
the, the, the neoclassical production function. But I totally believe that, I totally agree with you that from the radical um, um, uh, Joan Robson stand, uh, uh, viewpoint, uh, uh, and then followed by Pazinetti and Caldo and many other uh, Cambridge economists, uh, uh, the, the neoclassical production function is is just a, a, a crazy idea and makes no sense. But okay, uh, I think it makes sense. Uh, but if you want, you see, but, uh, the, my my point of view is not. Uh, I, I, my my results don't actually depend on the the, the neoclassical uh, on the neoclassical production function, right? I can I can I can work with a much simpler. Uh, 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 what is the Domar? What's the, uh, the what's the the Harrod Domar technology, and I generate the same result, right? Okay. So uh, I, I'm not worried about that. Actually, I do prefer the neoclassical productivity function. Uh, is <laughs> one of the things that Professor George Thompson and I already discussed it about because one of the fragilities of this mo this kind of model is that they don't have an investment function. And you cannot provide an investment function without uh, working in a, uh, in a SES or in a cop Douglas type of function. It's really hard to work in an investment function uh, in a Leontief, but in Leontief type of productivity function. So uh, it, it is really interesting, and I, I am inter interested in this kind of model uh we, we will have a lot of things to now you discuss. see uh, uh, that's the point uh, we are here that this is the the the, the, the interesting side of of uh, a workshop we, we get to know other people research or the uh, other people questions etc and uh, basically uh, is is a cross fertilization we should work together you know like i am open to work with all of you uh, uh, either developing some of my insights developing your insights and see what we get you know the important thing is to 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 think think write papers try to publish and advance the knowledge right uh, i am open to all our, our, our endeavors, intellectual endeavors, and I would be pleased to work here with any one of you, right? Uh, for me, it's feel free to contact me and uh, we go from there. <laughs> it will be a pleasure, Daniel. <laughs> we will write an email too. To yeah, all right. And, uh, send, yeah, our send, paper. Send, send the paper and uh, we, we, we go and uh, and then we we cross fertilize, uh, fertilize it because uh, you see the, the point that uh, George Thompson made. We 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 already you see the, we because we are old guys, right? So we are very experienced. So uh, uh, the, the the first discussion that I had with uh, Thompson was like, hey, let's write a paper to Cambridge Economic Journal about. <laughs> <laughs> about this so we decide where to publish and then we, we okay now what is the idea <laughs> excellent okay guys uh, i think we can move on to the next uh, presentation uh it will be a theoretical note on the super multiplier approach in labor constrained economy george thompson john gabriel will present it um okay so it's um uh, 15 to 15 to 3 p.m and you have the floor João você vai compartilhar a tela? Ah, beleza. Já já descompartilhei. Ah, tá. É é Uh, vocês podem ver minha apresentação? Estão vendo ela? Estão vendo, estão vendo. Uhum. Ah, ótimo. Berta, uh, you should. Ok. It, it's better if you press uh, F5. Better now? Yes. Yeah, tá legal. If I shift the, the slides, you can see? See. OK. You OK, start, so Professor George. I, I will <laughs> just uh, kick off with some sort of uh, preliminary thoughts, and, and then Jean-Gabriel will uh, 
actually make the presentation. So uh, this literature, the, this Raffian sub super multiplier approach, uh, it grew out of this um, idea from some of the Cambridge Keynesians of extending the, the general theory into the long run, right? So lots of efforts were made in the 50s, all the way through the 80s to, to get it done somehow. And, and, and the work by Caldor, Pazinetti, and, and John Robinson in the 50s and 60s was in part uh, a response to that uh, demand, right? To sort of uh, make Keynes uh, relevant in the long run, to say that the, the issues of uh, uh, the, the effective demand do not just apply to the business cycle. It, it affects the trajectory of the economy. And, and so all these authors set out to, to prove that uh, in different ways. And the Cambridge equation is one of the, uh, the outputs of this general research. Now, there was another strand of um, Cambridge thought that didn't really follow that line very much. And, and that started with uh, Piero Rafa himself, but then uh, I think was pursued by Piero Garagnani, especially, and then by some of their disciples like John Eatwell, uh, Murray Milgate. And so those guys wanted to have a long run theory of output. They are not talking about economic growth, They're a long run theory of output, the determinants of output that was demand driven, that would at the same time be consistent with the Israfian um, uh, scheme of uh, equilibrium prices, right? Israfian would have the, uh, uh, his uh, system of, of uh, natural prices. And as you know, the, the Israfian system is open-ended. You need a closure. And uh, well, the Cambridge equation offers one possible closure. Another closure was this one uh, that uh, Garignani and Eatwell were trying to pursue. Uh, around the time that I was in Cambridge, Franklin Serrano was trying to uh, come up with this long run theory of output, and he, he resuscitated the, the Hicksian super multiplier approach and applied to that context, right? So that is how this whole thing uh, emerged. I, I'm not sure if uh, Eatwell, for example, signed off on this. I know that Garignani must have agreed because Garignani was a kind of informal advisor to, to Franklin uh, at the time. And uh, so this literature started with this uh, super multiplier approach. So in the end, is a, is, so, so that we know what this animal here is about, uh, it's, it's, about, it's an attempt to create a long-run theory of output that uh, is Keynesian in essence, but is consistent with this Raffian um, structure of natural prices. So that's the, the general idea. Now, um, what this paper that Jean Gabriel and I wrote is trying to uh, show is that they. Uh, the, the, the work by Serrano and, and his uh, um, uh, colleagues and, and followers uh, really relies on one assumption that it actually involves the uh, 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 Leontief technology. And the assumption is that labor is always abundant, right? You are always in a situation that uh, the, uh, the, the restricted restrictive factor is capital, not labor. Right? So, and then they build um, a type of accelerator investment function that essentially says, okay, capital is the scarce factor, but as the economy grows, as, as output expands, you have uh, um, an incentive to invest more and, inve and, and then you have a kind of a, a virtual a cycle, right? But what we show here is that in, in the case that you actually question that, uh, that, that assumption that the constraining factor is capital, but rather 
labor, and, and this is empirical, empirically relevant in a number of circumstances, like for example, during the pandemic, right? Then you have a problem with the investment function because the investment function that they have in these models would uh, continue to, to, um, uh, to, to get investments to be made even after uh, the, the labor constraint has been hit, right? So you'd have a process of over accumulation uh, of capital that we don't fully specify the dynamics. We illustrate with a, a number uh, of, uh, of diagrams, but the point is that in, in order to have a more complete super multiplier theory, these guys need a different investment function or they would have to acknowledge that the investment function is conditional on which factor is the constraining one, right? So they can have a constraining uh, investment function for a capital constrained economy and they could have an investment function for a labor constrained economy. But what they have right now leads to this inconsistency and that's what we are trying to show. And we also show some countervailing uh, influences like technological progress that um, essentially um, show that uh, you, you can kind of uh, ameliorate the problem a little bit, but you don't solve it. You, you really need to work on the investment function. So uh, with that, uh, let me give the floor to, to João to actually do the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I have some reflections about our paper. Né? The first one is uh, the focus of our paper is in particular the heterodox macroeconomic model, the Higgs is half and super multiplier, uh, that the Jorge already uh, explained to us. Our, we are not proposing a new approach. We are just uh, providing a critique of this is having a Higgs is half and super multiplier model in the important case when labor is constrained is constraining factor of production for us if we have the labor as a constraining factor the model will will create a, it will expand the excess of demand and uh, the labor shortage we point out that the case under consideration clearly shows the limitations of the Higgs half and super multiplier approach, particularly with respect to the pre accelerated type investment function adopted by the Higgs half and super multiplier type of model. This weakness will become clear over the course of this presentation. It should be noted that the Higgs half and super multiplier model does not include features often found in mainstream macro, macro models, such as explicit macro foundations and rational expectations, which is different than, uh, which is really different than Professor Joca or, uh, presented in, in his paper. Uh, however, that is not the focus of our analysis. The basic model is this. We have the first equation, which is a Leon Teff type of function, and we have a, 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 a supply income equals to the, the labor activity. We have a, rest, a restriction where L star here is, is the limit of the labor, and our labor activity is less or equal to this L star. The demand is equal to consumption plus investment plus exports less import or next exports. The consumption function is a, a marginal propensity to consume times the, the demand and the investment function is this investment share, which is the accelerator, uh, investment accelerator in this kind of model. The import function is equal to the, uh, an import share times the demand and the export is an exogenous variable X is a star. Uh, we found the, the same uh, Higgs is having a super multiplier uh, here, which is one uh, divided by one less 
the marginal propensity to consume plus the uh, the investment acceleration accelerator plus the import share if we consider this kind of model if we consider this uh, the effective demand function we have some problems which is expressed by the graphics uh, in these presentations né? So, first we have uh, an equilibrium between the demand and the supply, but we have a restriction here in the, in the labor. Our L star here is the amount of labor restricted in this, in this model, and we have a labor shortage because our equilibrium will, will have to occur in L0. But since we, we are restricted, uh, the quantity of labor, we have a labor shortage and an excess demand uh, generated by this restriction. But if the accelerator mechanism overaccumulates capital, what happens? We, we have an acceleration in the demand, so our our effective demand here will be now the effective demand two, and the equilibrium will will raise. So uh, the necessary uh, level of employment will also raise. Então, so we have an increase to the labor shortage here, which is bigger than the original labor shortage, and we will also have an increase the excess de uh, uh, excess demand which is bigger than the original excess demand because because of the accelerator mechanism we, we are continuing to accelerate the accumul the accumulation of capital and we are we do not have more workers because our our restriction in the quantity of laborers here is in l star which is similar to what was discussed by uh, International Monetary Fund uh, in, the, in their working papers, demonstrating that we have a labor shortage in, in the US and other countries. Figure three, uh, a countervailing mechanism, labor argument, technical progress, and weaker animal spirit. What happens? Well, we we had an accelerator mechanism impulsing the effective demand, and now if we have a labor argument technical progress, if we have an, an improved technical mechanism to labor, we will provide a, a bigger uh, productivity. So our our productivity function here will raise and uh, we will have this productivity this supply too this will make our excess demand be smaller so we will have a smaller uh, reduce the excess demand and also we reduce the the labor shortage will will be smaller than the original labor shortage but we will have to continue to have this kind of uh, this this kind of behavior during all the process, and the figure uh, figure four shows that if you don't we don't have this kind of uh, mechanism, our demand will will be shifted uh, to a smaller uh, amount than the original one and the ex to reduce the excess demand and also reduce the labor shortage, which is presented by figure four, a lower marginal propensity to invest as a countervailing factor. Our investment will have to dis disaccelerate during the process to, to create a smaller excess demand and reduce the labor shortage. In this way, if the investment is slowed down, we will have a loss in efficiency of production and also the, the, the supply will reduce 
and we will have a new equilibrium between demand and supply in terms of the labor, uh, the restricted level of labor, which is given by L star here. So, what is our concluding remarks? The model studied in this paper certainly uh, contains two potential problematic implications for the Higgs's half and super, super multiplier models. First, with labor as a binding constraint, the super multiplier model no longer provides a poorly or even largely demand driven framework for the determination of long period output. In fact, aggregate supply apply, uh, plays a major, if not the main, Whole in, the uh, in determining in output in the long period. Second, the investment acceleration function is traditionally formulated becomes inadequate for the labor constraint economy. This is due to the fact that this investment function does not include mechanisms to make firms stop accumulated capital before the supply of labor turns binding. Uh, as I, I presented in my question to Professor Joca, uh, this is one of the problems uh, that I believe it will be corrected if we consider another type of productivity function in this kind of model, uh, where we will be able to provide an alternative investment function or an investment function, which is different to, to this kind of model, to correct these uh, these problems, uh, but as as I already said, and Professor and George already said too, we are not providing a new framework. We are providing a critic about this original framework. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, João, George. Um, is there any questions? Okay, João, please. Uh, João, your microphone is turned off. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah? Okay, uh, I, I like very much the, 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 the notes. I, 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 could you please put the second graph uh, on, please? Because uh, uh, it, it's something that uh, it, it may pass it through your minds, but uh, I, 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 I need because you, you see, I, I like this. You show that exactly the, the, the model doesn't converge, but uh, I, I want you to show show up the, the, the graph, the second. You see this one? Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Okay. In this one, you, you, you are considering the effect of the accelerator mechanism that makes the situation worse. OK, yes. but if you if you look, uh, uh, I think that you can play a little bit with uh, if you can, can go back to the equation of the accelerator, please go back to the accelerator equation. You see, if you increase the marginal propensity to import. Right, you can okay. you can you, you, you can shift the, 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 the demand curve to the to the left. So as to eliminate exactly this, or to counterbalance the the impact of the of the of the uh, of the accelerator, do you understand it? So as that uh, everything boils down to the following: everything boils down to make m equal to c plus h, right? Okay. So you have you have an equilibrium, but you have an equilibrium with labor shortage, all right, L star, and a much smaller income. Go back to, to the graph, please, the first graph. So you see at point A, you just extend this line, right, and make the YD go to the sh shift to, 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 to the left, all right, up to the line of uh, A, YS0, right? And then okay. you have an equilibrium. So when M equals to, uh, uh, to, 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 the, to, the, to the two multipliers, the consumption to the two accelerators, the consumption and the, 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 the uh, investment, you have, uh, you have this equilibrium, you have an equilibrium. 
uh, it's not explosive, but the, the, the cost of this equilibrium is that the actual equilibrium income is much smaller and is consistent with the, the, the labor shortage, right? So uh, uh, the, the, the issue that you, you, you are stressing is that it's more likely that M is going to be smaller than the accelerator, right? But yes. again, because you see, we, uh, all of these depends on what lies behind these 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 uh, parameters. You know, the marginal propensity to consume, the marginal propensity to invest, and the marginal propensity to 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 import. So, uh, what I suggest you to go forward in this model is exactly to provide uh, some kind of uh, feedback uh, mechanism. Imagine the folly. Look. Uh, you see, we know that nowadays we have this Krugmanian economics, all right? That is uh, this uh, 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 f fusion, you know, like a, a, an industry produces several parts of uh, its pieces in different countries. So they have to, this intra industry trade. Do you understand? So uh, an investment is no longer detached from imports and either exports be honest right so if you do if you do this so in your go, go back to the equations please you see the equations for six for investment right you can play investment here yeah uh, age y plus something that depends on m on imports do you understand? So when you yes. do that, the multiplier is going to change. And it's going to counterbalance. No? Yes. So actually you could you could make the fall age times y y uh, plus m. Do you understand? So you 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 try this simple format, you are going to change the multiplier. And therefore, there will be a, a counter a, a, a counterweight. So you you can play along these these lines and, and, and make a, a very good a very good point, which which is exactly what many people are. Uh, you see the question of Lucas about uh, about why why capital uh, capital flows and the labor doesn't right and. Uh, it, it, this is exactly what apparently you are dealing here. OK, so that, that is a very interesting because then you don't you don't even need to go to go to towards a, a, a neoclassic production function. You don't need to substitute to one. You see, you have a such a beautiful and simple framework that you just can play with these two equations, you know, like the investment function, try to do it as a function of imports or exports. All right, so you have a counterbalance in your in your multiplier, and therefore it, it, it not necessarily you have an explosive, inefficient equilibrium. You may have uh, a, 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 to reach an equilibrium, right? And uh, yes. you can play with that and, and get some some interesting insights. I think. Uh, I I I would like to to. To comment on something, um, not only the the presentation was very interesting, but uh, the the last comments of Professor João Faria remembered me a lot of uh, what Brazil uh, experienced, like a shortage a shortage of uh, skilled labor, and a problem with uh, when the economy was growing too much, there was always a problem of uh, a balance of payments uh, constraints. Uh, do uh, to to high um, imports uh, to high imports uh, coefficients. So I I I really think there is a, it's a very interesting um, path if you if you if you try what Professor João Faria is saying. Um, it was just a comment. Okay, Henrique. 
Okay, hi. Yeah, very interesting and uh, resonates with a lot of things I've been thinking uh, lately. And I'm experiencing the situation like um, reading a lot about uh, development where uh, labor is abundant and uh, living here in a country where labor is uh, short. <laughs> There's a shortage of labor like structural and nowadays even more recently and we live this every day, you know, like there are no people working. Uh, so uh, what I uh, caught my attention also um, building on uh, João's comment uh, is yeah, the, the sensibility of the results to the parameters, because uh, as I said, if you change the parameters for imports, for instance, or even the super multiplier, the parameter for uh, the multiplier, the parameter for investment, the H there. Uh, so how can you uh, arrive at different patterns? Because uh, I've been concerned about this lately because uh, some models I've been studying, you see like uh, the sensitivity to the parameters is very strong. And sometimes you have like parameters adjusting. The speed of adjustment is sometimes also crucial. So how do you um, see that like in this uh, framework? George, would you like to answer their questions or <laughs> should I? <laughs> Your microphone is closed. OK, why, why don't you? Uh, start and then I, I take a step at it. Okay. Uh, so uh, at, in this kind in this kind of model, Professor Jocke, uh, the, the their theory is that uh, the consumption and the imports are fixed. We don't have a dynamic variable here. We have yeah. on a fixed variable. <laughs> which is really difficult to work with and to incorporate into this kind of uh, model uh, properly to develop your your comment. I think that your comment is fabulous, is, is brilliant. So I, 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 sh I, I my, my, my focus now is to incorporate the Toro's law into this kind of model, which will provide a more efficient uh, dynamic model to export and import. So I, I think that it is really great to, to see your comment and uh, I will try to incorporate it then to the, the, the paper, but it is really hard because the import share, the consumption, the marginal propensity to consume and uh, all the other variables in, uh, besides the investment share are fixed, which is a really, really big problem. This, this kind of model is inspired in papers uh, wrote in the, the 50s and in the 60s, and they did not provide any update into this kind of model, which is sadly because we don't have a theory of investment, uh, an investment function. We don't have uh, a proper investment to consume, a consumption function. We don't. We, we only have simple functions and fixed parameters, which is really, really hard to deal with. Uh, I'm trying to improve this kind of model. The fourth chapter of my thesis, this is the, the third chapter, of my thesis and the fourth chapter of my thesis is I, I tried to incorporate the elasticity of labor demand into demand to to provide an alternative solution but uh, the brazilian academia and also most of the international academia which are dealing with this kind of model are not uh, they, they are not receiving these comments uh, friendly. They are really, really averse to this. Thank you. Professor George, please, <laughs> you can make your comments. I, yeah, I have yeah, to so go to the other section. Right. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So, João, João Gabriel just hinted at uh, one issue is that um, we uh, sent this paper to a few outlets and uh, so sometimes we get pretty aggressive uh, feedback, 
right? And uh, people would not really question very much the logic, but the relevance of this exercise. And I think that the uh, the idea uh, was that this was misunderstood, right? That we are trying to propose something new, uh, while what we are trying to show was an internal inconsistency, right, in in the approach and and how where the inconsistency was coming from and how potentially to solve it. I think one thing that we can do, and I think all, all your comments are very nice and nicely put, and, and I think would help, but one of the things that I think we need to do is uh, to show the dynamics, the actual, uh, to spell out the dynamics, right? We did that graphically. I think we wouldn't have to actually uh, develop a, a, a dynamic equation but I, I'll, I'll be very frank with you. I, I think that, that uh, um, how, speaking of investment, I'm not sure how much investment uh, we want to do in this uh, literature, which I think finds itself in a, in a kind of uh, cul-de-sac, right? I, 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 even though there's a lot of people working on, on these themes, I mean, there are a lot of uh, adherents to, to, to this uh, type of model, I, I don't think it's, it's very promising. So, uh, uh, and time is scarce. So, uh, why, why invest too much in in complicating this, right? So, this is something that João Gabriel and I have been kind of struggling. But I, we see where we could uh, try to be more persuasive. We see uh, the issue is, <coughs> is it worth it? I'm not entirely convinced. But but I think that uh, uh, your your points were all uh, um, very relevant and we will definitely consider. But the, the issue is whether uh, uh, this is worthwhile pursuing, right? I actually I told Jean Gabriel, uh, look, I, I mean you are done with your PhD thesis uh, on that. There's a lot of work on that super super multiplier. Now move on from this, right? I I don't think this is. Uh, 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 the best way to spend your uh, scarce uh, time. Anyway, thanks. Thanks a lot. Sure. And, and let, let me just tell you one thing because everything you 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 said a, a beautiful thing about uh, this literature is in a in type of a coup de sac. That that is there is no way out, and uh, I I do believe that is it, first you are targeting. Uh, uh, you are targeting a literature that doesn't want, doesn't like change, right? And most people are, they call themselves heterodox, but they are orthodox in their heterodoxy. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right? right. So yeah. what I suggest you to do is just change the venues. Just change the venue. You don't send it to typical uh, uh, yeah. journal of post keynesian economics journals. You have to change to uh, to other types of of of. of uh, and I would that that's why I, I see a way out of the coup de sac. I I I I foresee that if you make a discussion on this Krugmanian link mm -hmm. between investment and open open economy, right? And then you are going to generate a super of the super multiplier. You see, it's a right. multiplier that has a, 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 a integrates uh, the, 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 the the forces uh, the, the, of the, the investment and open open economies, and uh, that would be a, a something very uh, sellable for. I'll tell you what journals would take this, like Journal of International Economics, uh, Review of International Economics, and uh, other venues like uh, 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 Open Economies um, Review, right? So you have to try exactly this side of uh, literature. Move out exactly what you said is correct, uh, uh, George. Is a dead end in, in, to, in the for the post Keynesians because they don't like change. But this is a very promising line of research for other areas because it's a new. You, you see, you're going to send it to an open economies review. No one knows that. There are people that never came across this type of uh, right. of uh, framework, and therefore it's a novelty. 
Yeah, that, that, that's great advice. Really, yeah. really appreciate that. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah, all right, thank you. Okay, guys, I guess it's my turn to present. Let me. my screen or not. I think that you have to ask uh, uh, George or, or 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 João Gabriel to uh, to leave their their sharing. OK, now is you you're right. Ah, you can see now. OK. Um, I can only see like a small window with your with your presentation somehow. But, uh. Sorry, guys, uh, my computer is very very uh, slow. OK, now you see. Perfectly. OK. OK, so uh, the, the, the title of the paper is uh, an examination of John Robinson's simple model, a proximity to Calder's Robinson Cambridge theorem. Uh, OK, the, the central objective of this paper uh, is to investigate the influence of Robinson's uh, 1953 capital accumulation theory and her the and her her book the accumulation of capital which in my opinion is, uh, is her most important book uh, on Calder's theory uh, of growth and income distribution named Cambridge theorem um, the the paper uh tries to to demonstrate uh Jones Robinson pri priority or at least her big influence in the formulation of the so-called Cambridge equation or as usually is referred Calder Pasinetti pa theorem um the in uh, the income and distribution long term or long period theory uh is usually referred to as Calder's uh Calder's 1956 paper as the the starting one uh however uh three years before John Robinson uh with her um with her paper on on capital uh in between the the capital contro uh, controversy uh, already established uh, the assumptions which made uh possible Calder's formalization at least this is our hypothesis. Um, nevertheless, uh, she uh, she was not she was kind of neglected in our view, uh, and you can you can take a look in all those papers listed. Uh, little is said about her. Um, okay, so the, the mentioned Cambridge theory uh, started to be an alternative theory to Solo's neoclassical approach. Their proposal uh, was to solve the well-known knife-edge problem proposed by Harrod and Omer, which demonstrates that only in a huge coincidence, the natural and warranted growth rates are equal. 
Um, on, on one hand, Robert Solo provided that solution by endogenizing the capital output ratio and later demonstrating that, demonstrating that this is the level of technological progress in the economy. On the other hand, Calder and his disciples uh, presented a solution by endogenizing uh, the level of economic savings, which provides a rigorous analysis of how income behaves and creates the possibility of producing alternatives to a more equalized economy between workers and capitalists. Right. Uh, so uh, part of, of our work uh, is based on Jones Robinson's simple model, which she presented uh, on, uh, on her book, The Accumulation of Capital. And uh, what, what is interesting is that this book was not well received uh, by the critics, and uh, I, I didn't put in the presentation, but uh, we have lots of uh, reviews of this book in uh, journals, and all of them I uh, criticize uh, the way she uh, she uh, the way she she presented uh, the book because it was not uh, it was not uh, formalized, and there was an intricate language uh, in, in a in a way very similar to, to Keynes' uh, general theory. Uh, and uh, though the, the exposition she presented uh, was in fact very complex, uh, I, we believe that the book uh, clarifies uh, lots of issues, such as the long-term determinant of the accumulation of capital. Uh, and uh, we are talking about ex specifically on this point uh, uh, about her her simple model, which is chapter eight nine uh, mainly. Oh, she develops a, a two sector model, which is the simple model, uh, in order to highlight the main features of the capital accumulation process. Uh, the model comprises a sector that produces consumption goods and a sector of producer goods. Oh, uh, it's. It's mainly the, the consumption sector and the investment sector. She introduced some simplifying assumptions to avoid the index number problem and other non-essential assumptions, such as one technique, only one final good, a composite commodity, homogeneous labor, um, minimum size for minimum size firms, no consumption out of profits, and all wage income spent in consumption goods. Um, uh, she notes, she, she first, and I, I think uh, Professor Jorge uh, made this observation, it was about uh, this, this paragraph on her book. Uh, she notes first uh, that the first constraint to, to the accumulation of capital is the existence of a technical surplus above the level of subsistence. So in order uh, to to accumulate capital, you you need uh, the possibility, you, you need the existence of a surplus, or something that uh, that is residual uh, in the process. Uh, she also remarks that the the relationship between profits and accumulation is dubious. In her in her words, it's two sided. Uh, the existence of a technical surplus is not a sufficient condition for the accumulation of capital, but it must be accompanied by the application of this surplus into the creation of new productive capacity. As she puts it, uh, and uh, I think this, this is a very, very beautiful paragraph, uh, the relationship between profits and accumulation is two-sided. For profit to be obtainable, there must be a surplus of output per worker over the consumptions per worker's family necessary to keep the labor force in being. So there must exist a technical surplus. But the existence of a potential uh, technical surplus is not a sufficient condition for profits to be realized. It is also necessary that uh, entrepreneurs should be carrying out investment. Um, she uh, once she considers uh, that workers spend all they earn in consumption, uh, the assumption that there is no consumption out of profits and that the economy is in a state of tranquility, which is her way of 
of saying that the, the economy is in equilibrium. Um, this description of the relationship between profits and accumulation is not only a restatement of uh, von Neumann's theorem, but also a, a restatement of the effective demand principle. And uh, to, to, to clarify, the von Neumann's theorem says that the rate of profit uh, must be equal to the rate of accumulation. Uh, and this holds, uh, this holds exactly when uh, there is no, no uh, capitalist consumption or consumptions out of profits. Uh, if there is consumption out of profits, you have uh, not the equality, but uh, you have uh, a, multi, uh, a relationship that says that uh, the rate of profit is a multiple or uh, a multiple of the the rate of accumulation. Uh, and she she then proceeds to to give um, to to give some examples, and this is. This is very uh, peculiar because she she was not only uh, talking about uh, uh, the accumulation of capital and uh, uh, um, functional uh, income distribution, but she was also um, she was also uh, talking about uh, some methodological. She, she was. Uh, in lots of ways advancing. And one of the ways was her uh, methodological advancements and uh, with her her uh, definitions and her discuss discussions of uh, types of equilibrium. Um, and she, she, in this book and with this model, she, she has, uh, she gives uh, three examples or three, three, uh, three situations uh, as she exemplifies uh, with the model, she did not formalize that, and uh, I, I I think that this is uh, this is one of the reasons that uh, I believe she was uh, like uh, she was kind of neglected. Well, well, uh, Robinson then proceeds to to present a series of of examples that take into account two economies which are all equal in all but one characteristic which she ought to, to, to demonstrate that this difference is determinant to the possible paths which each of, of them, of the two economies, follow. Uh, this is a, examples also taking into account two, two different situations in regards to, to the supply of labor. Uh, the first one, where Robinson demonstrates the consequences of a change in a degree of monopoly to the accumulation in the long run, takes into consideration a supply of labor that adjusts automatically to the demand for labor. Uh, and the two other examples where she considers scarcity and surplus of labor supplies. So I will not, uh, I have in the presentation uh, the the example she, she gives, but uh, I will not talk about that. What uh, I I want to, 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 to say is that uh, she was, uh, she was advancing in lots of directions uh and um there are lots of hypotheses why she was not uh, uh so cited or like she uh she didn't have uh the same um how can i say uh the same prestige as for example i guess calder and this is a statement that can be defied also uh but um one, ex one, one hypothesis that her model was not formalized. Uh, the other hypothesis is, is that um, she was a woman, um, which is, uh, which is, she, she is being rediscovered now also because of that. Uh, the other hypothesis is that um, she, she uh, talked about very intricate and complex, like philosophical matters of the of the profession and the science, uh, and I guess this uh, this kind of um, made other economists like uh, not follow her. Uh, and also, I believe that she uh, <clears throat> that that. Uh, Besides the non-formalization of the model, uh, she did not take into account. She did. She did not uh, make a, uh, an aggregate uh, model. 
this model has two sectors, and I guess this this also uh, complicates things uh, when we compare to to the Cambridge theorem. Uh, but uh, the the main the main uh, yes the main uh, framework was was already there with Keynes and Kalecki. Uh, and she she was working on this this framework, and we want to we are investigating this. We we are arguing that she was neglected uh, because of this this series of um, this this series of hypotheses I I raised here. That is the presentation. Uh, George? Daniel, uh, thank you, Daniel. Uh, I, I think this is a very nice initiative that you are trying to kind of uncover this, this mysteries about, about John Robinson. And, and I think that uh, all these guys, Kaletsky, uh, but mostly Robinson, Caldor, Pazinetti were all after one thing, right? Which was this again, the thing that I mentioned before, the long run theory of of growth or output, and and I think they developed similar things, but uh, a bit differently. So uh, the, the Pazinetti model that uh, Zocca discussed and that Joanilio worked quite a lot, um, it, it doesn't have an explicit investment function right uh, because he wanted to show the um, the paradox right there uh, uh, worker savings did not enter the determination of, of the rate of profits even if workers saved but uh, Caldor and, and Robinson they actually made an effort to come up with some kind of investment function because they wanted to understand uh, the, the full growth process and rival uh, Solos model, right? They wanted to have a full alternative to Solos model. I don't think that was Pazinetti's intention. So uh, Caldor tried in many articles to come up with some investment function. And um, one of them was actually with uh, uh, James Murley's. Right? They were using these uh, vintage models that were kind of fashionable back in the in the late 50s, 60s. Um, but one thing that Caldor did not do, he had very complicated investment functions, by the way, uh, especially the last one with James Merlis. And one thing that Caldor did not do explicitly was this double-sided relationship between profitability and investment. He didn't have that, right? Uh, John Robinson, on the other hand, uh, she ended up formalizing a little bit her model in the in the 1962 book, the um, essays in the theory of economic growth, right? That simple model, the famous banana diagram, right? Uh, and there she has a much simpler investment function, but one that actually has this double-sided relationship um, explicit. Uh, and then uh, all other people try to. Uh, create more robust versions of, of, of her model, uh, especially uh, Asimakopoulos, and, and then much later, uh, Stephen Margling, uh, Donald Harris. Uh, so those guys mm -hmm. try to formalize uh, in more detail and also try to uh, combine in some cases with this Raffian system. Uh, so there was some effort to sort of make it a little bit more uh, robust, but John Robson herself, yeah, she only went so far in terms of being able to formalize her model. She has a, a very simple uh, formulation, but behind that simple formulation, there's this big idea that you have this right, this dynamic relationship between um, uh, profits and investment, and, and that relationship works through expectations, and those expectations are what. Keynes used to call the state of long-term expectations. Right? That's it. So they, they put that together. Uh, what, what I think is miss, missing in all this picture and uh, 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 is 
a, a very clear and persuasive expectation rule, right? I think that normally uh, what they do is uh, some uh, uh, assume static expectations, and that's it. That, that that's the whole the whole point, right? But but the insight that the link between these uh, different sides of the equation is expectations, I think is a powerful one. Uh, and I think that's, that's a big contribution. And by the way, she was not the one that came up with that. It was Kaletsky, uh, but she projected that into, into the long run. So Kaletsky had that idea because he wanted to criticize Keynes' uh, marginal efficiency of capital uh, theory, right? He wanted to criticize that. Say, well, Keynes is, is wrong in this aspect because of this. And, uh, and, and he came up with this notion of this uh, uh, dynamic relationship. But then Robinson took this relationship and ran with it and created a theory of growth based on it, right? And I think this is an important point to, to, to stress. Thank you. Okay, uh, I, I, I want to, to... I, I, Henrique, go, go on, go on. Then I speak. Yeah, I just, I just want to actually to to ask you if you feel there's something else in there because so interesting. I'm so curious because it resonates a lot to what we find really puzzling uh, about uh, investments, like what are the real determinants, and when all the theories are trying to like nobody satisfied with an investment function. Everybody's trying to uh, adapt and uh, find new forms, and uh, so this is very. I think it's one of the puzzles now. Uh, yeah, if you find uh, uh, anything in there that uh, you think it's, it's still hidden, and we want to talk about, like we should, we should be talking about it because the determinants of investment they they seem to be a little bit um, uh, subjective, so expectations or uh, and you, you cannot tie this together into an investment equation that makes sense to everyone. So uh, in, if you don't have that, if you don't have like uh, an equation that determines expectation, if you cannot tie, then you are uh, in a Harrodian world or you are um, uh, in a world where it's hard to explain how you have like a centuries long uh, growth trend. Like, uh, so um, yeah, I'm wondering uh, what, uh, what else could, uh, Robinson have said that that we should hear again. If you have something that you while you were reading, uh, some uh, intuition or insight that we, we should bring to our uh, current literature. Um, so uh, she, the the thing is, I'm most interested in her uh, equilibrium, uh, in her equilibrium discussion. Like for example. Uh, she develops this mod, this simple model in her book, and she she is assuming that the state of tranquility, which is a an equilibrium state, but uh, in her examples she she develops like a simulation with the model. Uh, I, this is this is kind of uh, this is not uh, what usually happens. I guess in the economic literature, I know like uh, general equilibrium models, which they they work with uh, simulations. ABM work with simulations also, and uh, the equilibrium in these models uh, they just work for for the the comparison between a situation. Like it's a dynamic static uh, exercise. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, she she works with that, and I I. I really don't know how to to model this kind of stuff because uh, uh, expectations it's kind of a stochastic thing like it's political it's uh, and uh, and uh, what really what I'm I'm intrigued and that's why we are we are studying Robinson is is what what she was like what what she where she was going and uh uh, to 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 answer uh, George, I, I would like to to thank you I, your comments. Uh, yeah, um, I, I I I'm I'm really uh, we we are going to 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 work more on the on this this paper. But uh, yes, I I believe that it was all in Kaleki, uh, and uh, 
and uh, I guess I guess this is a contribution uh, uh, that she gave, like uh, to to try to expand this to 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 the long term. Um, and uh, but uh, we we are going to I guess we have to to access her letters. We are going to do that. Her letters with uh, Calder to see what they were talking about and to to. Uh, Kind of uh, do what you what you did with your with the paper you present to us, which was very very interesting. So, uh, João. Yeah, uh, 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 Daniel, uh, uh, I have a. My point is the following. Uh, I'm 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 going to be a little bit uh, as a referee here, right? I want to know what is the point of your paper. What what is the main message? Uh, the main message is that uh, uh, I think she was forgotten uh, by by most part of the of the the economic uh, gathering. I guess but, but, she but she's is, al she's always remembered by the comparative uh, the uh, the the uh, I forgot how to say in English. Like uh, the uh, non-competitive equilibrium, she uh. she did like uh, right. from from orthodox guys and yeah. from heterodox guys, she 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 is also like uh, everyone says, oh, okay, uh, she is nice, but um, uh, I I I don't think uh, much work uh, on on her on her on her was was made, and uh, the point is that. Uh, she has lots of things that people are discovering now, or um, or saying that it that it was discovered after that it was already in her work, and she was already developing that. Yeah, it's a but, history of economic thought. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, I, I'm not sure whether you know, but I wrote uh, a, a manual of uh, history of economic thought. That is my my. My my master dissertation, the best master dissertation in economic history of economic thought ever written. That okay, you should look uh, at. What's the name should, of it? You should, it it's uh, the theories of uh, evolution and revolution in the interest rate theories. It's in the uh, 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 University of Brasilia uh, Central Library. But uh, okay. yeah, so but uh, what I uh, that that's the point that I am making because I worked a little bit with history of economic thought and uh, I I'm trying to help you to sell your your paper. So you have to understand what I'm going to say in, in, in not as a, 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 a acid crit criticism, but as a, a helpful criticism. So the, the, if you can take note of what I'm going to tell you, 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 it will help you to organize your ideas. All right. So first of all, you have to be, uh, you have to be very direct on what is your paper is all about, right? If you say that, uh, oh, um, Joan Hobbes is for uh, is forgotten and she doesn't deserve. This is not an argument, right? This is a no, nothing, right? Uh, if you say, look, she has an interesting theory that can be used nowadays. So, if this is your point, you have uh, you have to to uh, to give a foundation for this uh, sort of uh, affirmation. You know, like what are the 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 the, re the facts and the data about that that can kind of. Um, uh, 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 her theory can shed light. What are the current theoretical problems that her theory can uh, help to solve? All right. What the actual literature is saying about the correlated uh, 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 frameworks, uh, uh, and she can also help to 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 straighten and uh, and, uh, and complement this. These these literatures. So these are three three uh, basic points that you have to go right out bet whenever you write a paper on on on, on history of economic thought, right? And um, 
now I, I have to tell you, and I am going to answer you, uh, your first question. Well, you, you said that she was nice and uh, she was a bitch. She was uh. a bitch. Everybody knows that she was a, a massive bad woman. Uh, how do you know that? How do I know that? Well, if you study a little bit the history of the editorship of uh, the economic journal, and you see how uh, obnoxious Keynes and Austin Hobson was her uh, wife, uh, her uh, husband. <laughs> uh, see, uh, the economic journal was the main journal in economic in economics, right? And uh, thanks to uh, Joan Hobson and the group that she she was the chief, she was like the the head of the of the young uh, Keynesians, um, she influenced a lot Keynes in the ed editorship and then she put her her husband, uh, he was a, 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 the guy who was a nullity intellectually, the, you, you see he was like a, a, a small plant uh, in terms of IQ. So uh, 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 and they did uh, so much bad work with uh, the the economic journal that the economic journal was the the top journal in the economic uh, in the economic uh, profession uh, uh, in the beginning of the 1930s, and when Austin Robson uh, left the editorship, it was already not even more the main journal in England, right? So just for you to have an idea of. Uh, of uh, of this sort of of uh, input, and the other uh, the, the other thing is the following, uh, with regards to the discussion of uh, of the the growth theory, the development of growth theory, every single great theories of uh, economic growth is spent some time between 1953 and 1956 in Cambridge, England, discussing her ideas. Right, and I'll give you some uh, some examples. We have uh, Solo. He spent some time there. Um, um, uh, uh, the guy, uh, uh, George. What is the name of the guy that uh, uh, Andre Varela loves? Um, Harry Johnson mm. was there doing the PhD. Uh, 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 and various various visiting. Uh, some also visited uh, the, the department. Milton Friedman visited the, the department, and all the ideas that John Robson were discussing, right? And uh, all the points that she was uh, uh, putting forward were exhaustively discussed by the main brains at the time, right? So, you see, there is no, 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 no. You see, there is no BS here. You see. She was a really bad woman, a very bad uh, referee, referee um, maker. She, as a referee, she used to destroy and belittle every single paper that she disagrees with, right? And uh, in the in the seminars, uh, she used to be a real bitch, very aggressive, okay, and argumentative. So again, you you see, it's better for you to. <laughs> To choose the truth, that is all right. What the hell she's talking about? Is this useful? What do we learn with that? What this theory, can, where this use, this theory can be used? What data uh, or what uh, economic facts this theory illuminates? Wh how the, we can use some of the insights of this theory to to help build better investment models? That's 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 my point. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot, John. Uh, I I I truly believe uh, I have we have to to work more on on this paper. But um, I uh, I yeah I I have to be otherwise con convinced. But uh, I I believe that even though she was discussed, uh, she did not uh, get the full credit like uh, in terms of uh, of macro discussion, uh, I guess. But uh, just, it just may, a second, I, just a second. I, you, you, I you may know, think that uh, because uh, I'm still ignorant, but. Uh, I, I, OK, let me tell you one thing for your uh, uh, 
uh, for your, uh, your unhappiness, I have the collected papers of Samos on all the five big volumes. I can go there and, uh, and, uh, and count how many times he cites her. No, right? no, no. Anna, uh, it, uh, it, I, would, uh, I would talk to you. I, I, it's I, an, I like her it's an enormous amount. So, uh, it, it, you see, she was discussed, she was well known. And um, uh, the point that I would make is exactly that. It's like her fury when, uh, just crashed because even in Cambridge, even with their nearest friends, they develop better furies. And that's exactly why you don't see Caldo and Pazinetti, for instance, going deeply on her ideas. They may cite her, but they don't really consider their uh, her insights uh, 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 like something that was very illuminated, illu illuminating. Okay. Okay. Uh, George. Okay, so I um. I have somewhat uh, um, different, <laughs> not 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 completely, but somewhat different. So I uh, so first of all, getting into uh, uh, I think Zoka's main advice to to you, Daniel, in terms of the purpose of the paper. I think maybe you you, you should should really reorient the paper in terms of rather than saying, oh, this is a paper about why John Robinson has been neglected and forgotten, and rather than do that, uh, maybe to, uh, uh, going back to a previous comment that I made, try to see, okay, how, uh, what is John Robinson's enduring contributions, right? Uh, and, and, and why today she is, uh, uh, what happened? That today she is uh, um, not mainstream, right? Uh, I think that that, but but throughout her career, she was, uh, as Jocka pointed out, she was. Um, uh, I mean, she she was in debates with all the the major economists um, her, that were her contemporaries, right? And and not only for a short period of time; it was throughout her whole career. She was debating with. Uh, all these luminaries, right? So I would sort of move on a little bit from that point and say, look, what, what is John Robinson's enduring contribution? So I would go back to the uh, uh, to the point that I made before when I was comparing Pazinetti, Caldo, and Robinson, right? So they are uh, probably, together with uh, uh, Richard Kahn, the main heirs of, of Keynes, right? The, uh, the sort of the... Uh, uh, what they used to call the Cambridge Circus, the people who are around uh, uh, around Keynes and trying to uh, make this work of projecting Keynesianism into the long run. I think that's the main thing. So you have you have three versions at least of uh, projecting Keynesianism, Keynesianism into the long run from this group, right? Pazinetti's version, Calder's version, and Robinson's version, right? Uh, all of them today are kind of neglected, right? Uh, uh, all of them, uh, but uh, uh, I, I think it's worth uh, comparing these three versions, right, and saying, okay, what is special about each one of them? And I think that John Robinson has uh, uh, this this particular point, uh, which which was the again the um, this dynamic relationship between profits and investment, right? The the other two did not have. Uh, at least not to the same degree, right? So in some respects, we can say that the uh, we can make Pazinetti's model a special case of of John Robinson's model, in which he fixes uh, investment, right? Uh, so I, I would get that line of reasoning rather than trying to do the more sociological work of why she was neglected. And all that, but on that, on the, so I agree with Joka that if you go to the uh, collected papers of Samuelson, or if you look at Solo's papers, or uh, or other Hicks, or many other mainstream people, you see lots of references to to uh, um, to John Robinson and, and and people like Frank Hunt. So there's this story that Frank Hunt and John Robinson had a love hate relationship. My uh, uh, my my thesis supervisor, 
uh, Jeff Harcourt, he actually wrote something, I think called uh, Joe Robinson's and Frank Hans love hate relationship, right? So there was some kind of mutual admiration, but they they were in completely different camps, right? Um, so it's, it's it's good to recognize that. So uh, uh, she's less well known today rather than in the past. I think that's the first thing. And the second thing I think is better to to look at the, her enduring contribution. What what is it that she did that could potentially be resurrected today, right? Um, now, as to her personal behavior, um, I, I haven't met her, <laughs> I don't know, but uh, uh, my, my two uh, thesis advisors, both Zuanilio and, and, uh, and Jeff Harcourt, they, 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 they have Joe Robinson as a goddess, right? Well, maybe because of her bad behavior, they're not used to that. <laughs> anyway, thanks, that, that's it for me. Uh, I have some comments. Uh, uh, I'm I'm writing this paper with Daniel and Beatriz. Né? Uh, our perspective is to demonstrate that uh, in, in in somehow the the post Keynesian tradition, not the not the neoclassical or the uh, the mainstream literature, but the post Keynesian tradition uh, neglected her. Uh, this is based on a paper published in the Essays in Honor to Geoffrey Harcourt, uh, the paper 17, John Hobson's A Neglected Precursor Internal Migrations Model uh, by Tahir. Uh, we, we, wrote, we are writing this paper to demonstrate that even in her own tradition, she was neglected. Uh, you you can see in Calder's paper, in the Dutch's paper, Holthorn, uh, but during Margling, uh, even to the the most recent literature like uh, the Satterfield, Araújo, and the others, they they don't even sit her in her own theory. So I. I agree with Professor Joca about uh, Samuelson, Solo. Uh, I, I, I read some papers wrote by them, and uh, yes, she is quoted by them. Uh, I don't know if her behavior was uh, extremely aggressive, like you, you said, but uh, I believe in you. I choose to believe in you. Uh, uh, Jorge made a really great point uh, about to demonstrate how the theory was built on. Uh, but uh, our point is about this. We are trying to demonstrate that he was neglected in her own theory, in her own tradition, uh, the post keynesians and then the neo collection the post collection and others. He was neglected by then. And uh, in somehow, Professor Joaquin uh, Andrade here thinks that uh, it was because she was a girl, she was a woman. Uh, I don't know if this is true, and I'm not trying to demonstrate this. I am only trying to demonstrate that in her own line, in her own line of thinking, in her own tradition, she was neglected by the authors, uh, Calder, Pazinetti, uh, uh, Dutch, uh, Baduri, Marglin, and, and so on. So, but we will try to incorporate some of your comments because it is really interesting. I, I, I'm really interested to read about this kind of behavior. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Joanilio, Professor Joaquin, and the others uh really love her her theory and uh, they really appreciated her in person uh, we saw last night professor john Lido shows some pictures about her uh but uh, our point is that we are trying to demonstrate that in, in her own field in her own tradition she was not reckless uh is this uh, our our central point here.
Okay, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so I'll, I'll begin there. Uh, so uh, I'm talking about like the informal economy, and I'm inserting it into a collecting approach because um, I was dealing with this topic about informality in uh, middle income countries, and I was uh, studying like the collecting literature, and I know there. Are, there's a lot of Robinson in Calais, as I said. Uh, I, as um, you were presenting, I was thinking here to myself what I have been reading also recently. Uh, yeah, but then I thought it would be useful uh, kind of tool to analyze the uh, macroeconomic impacts of informality for um, middle-income countries specifically. So I'll have an introduction of the question and then uh, how I inserted this informality into, into a Calais uh, framework. And then I have an American simulation just to illustrate how it could work. Um, my main objective here with this work is to highlight the non-neutrality of the informal sector for the overall macroeconomic trajectory, especially in middle-income countries, in uh, least developed countries that could be even worse, but I'm thinking about middle-income countries. Uh, so, uh, so I introduced the uh, formality into this collection uh, framework, then I uh, point out a few mechanisms by which this, the presence and the extension, especially the extension of formality, could impact the uh, long run path. And then uh, I examine one particular possibility of uh, adjustment, how informality adjusts to movements in the uh, overall macroeconomic trajectory. So, uh, so uh, informality is, is a very distinctive characteristic of developing countries. It's almost a defining characteristic. And in development literature, uh, thought for a long time that uh, widespread uh, that uh, for, uh, formalization would come with growth. But then uh, we have seen in the past few decades that uh, it doesn't. Uh, countries grow in Latin America, especially also in Africa. Some Asian countries, they grow and the informality rate, the percentage of informality remains uh, resilient. Um, Lewis had the, the uh, perspective of uh, modernization. Uh, but this is a, a kind of a, a kind of a different subject. Uh, he was talking about uh, some subsistence sector, uh, some rural ag agricultural uh, traditional sector where output is not constrained by demand. And here I'm talking about informality as urban informality mainly. Uh, mainly. So uh, a lot of the literature nowadays, uh, even in a most post Keynesian uh, perspective, consider that. Uh, the, uh, the size of the informal sector could also be determined by uh, demand. So sometimes uh, we, when you grow the formal sector, you could grow a little bit uh, the informal sector also because uh, people have more money, so they demand also informal products. Uh, so uh, yeah, um, in a post-Keynesian uh, context, aggregate demand plays a, a major role for output determination. Any informal sector could alter that because a part of uh, uh, the demand for products for consumption leaks to the informal sector, but also uh, uh, workers in the informal sector they also consume. So if they're having a little bit more income, they could consume the formal sector. So this is uh, more or less uh, undetermined. So how would the formal sector uh, hurt or foster a little bit the growth of the formal sector? And yeah, we have uh, so we used the collection fr framework to deal with that. And I started with the basic uh, reproduction scheme, the uh, Marxian collection, where you have like the three sectors: so investment, uh, capitalist consumption, workers' consumption sectors. And each sector is uh, divided into a mass of wages and a mass of profits. So uh, putting things together uh, here in lines, I have uh, income. And in columns, I have uh, expenditure. So uh, output is uh, profits and wages, but it's also uh, investment, capitalist consumption, workers consumption. So uh, since uh, workers consumption equals uh, wages because workers do not save. So if you cut, we have um, profits are determined by uh, capitalist ex uh, expenditures. So uh, classic result. Uh, and then, so if you have uh, investment, uh, we substitute here three in four, and we see that output is entirely determined by investment and a few parameters. So uh, expenditure determines the um, capitalist expenditure determines the output, and then uh, we inserted uh, one informal sector that, uh, by assumption, uses no capital, so there are no profits in line with most of the literature, and so we have uh, this uh, informal income. 
uh, which I'm comparing to weights a little bit. So if you sum up the income here in the line, we have also this uh, informal uh, income uh, and uh, the profits remain the same. So now the total output is informal output and formal output. The formal output is as before, and we have now this informal output, which is determined by uh, expenditures by workers. So this is the uh, informal consumption. Uh, by assumption, workers from, from the formal wage mass, a percentage, gamma F, is spent in informal consumption. And then informal workers receive income, and they also spend a percentage, a different percentage here, also in formal consumption. So, um, so now the, the formal, uh, the, the workers' consumption sector is this uh, comprised by this income, formal and informal, that was not spent in informal consumption. Uh, so, uh, putting things together here, uh, uh, nine and ten, we are seven and nine. We have uh, that the informal sector, the size of the informal sector is entirely determined by uh, the, the wage mass in the formal sector and the parameters, uh, uh, the propensity to spend in informal consumption. And we can define also a formalization share, which is the formal sector uh, compared to the overall economy. So we can write it also like that. Uh, also, um, since we have this relationship, we can rewrite the a profit share, uh, comparing the mass of profits, uh, not only to the formal sector uh, output, but also to the overall output. So we have two representations. So the, the uh, wage share in the, the profit share in the formal sector and the overall profit share. We have this relationship between them. And since we have the profit share, we can also have the utilization rate. So here I'm assuming if we uh, uh, take full utilization to be the uh, full utilization of the uh, formal sector. So, uh, uh, potential output means uh, the fuel utilization of the formal production capacity. So uh, we have to rewrite it a little bit because if we take the output, a part of this output is informal. So we have to correct it to take into account that a part, uh, to take the utilization rate uh, in this expression to uh, take into account that a part of the output is uh, informal. So uh, when that goes to the investment, and, and now uh, it's, I know it's really uh, uh, hard to settle on an investment function because, as I said, uh, uh, yeah, a lot of discuss where investment comes from, how can we tie this together? Uh, so I took a more standard form, and I, we have to correct the utilization rate for the informal, uh, informal sector now. So a part of the output is informal. Uh, so we have this uh, growth rate of uh, stock of capital like that. And now this is what I want to simulate, how the uh, impact of informality can uh, influence the rate of growth and how it can be impacted by the rate of growth also. Because if you grow the formal sector faster, maybe you can shrink informality. And this is just like a few insights from uh, things we have been uh, doing uh, extensions of this. And we have some equilibrium uh, rate where uh, the more formal it is, the higher the utilization rate you're gonna reach. And the, the more formal you are, the uh, higher the profit rate you're gonna get. Uh, so uh, coming to some uh, numerical simulations, um, we can incorporate the informal sector to the formal sector, depending on these two parameters, which is the percentage of uh, consumption that workers, formal and informal workers spend in informal goods. So uh, if these parameters, they could either be fixed uh, by assumption or they could be endogenous. If they're endogenous, I could, uh, there are, in the literature, there are arguments to have them adjusting pro-cyclically or counter-cyclically. And I wanted to compare what happens to the overall uh, growth trajectory if they are one way or another. Uh, so uh, yeah, we conducted a few simulations and then uh, the first thing like without any external shocks or anything, uh, the utilization rate that counts for investments. So uh, with no informal sectors would be a little higher. Uh, I took very, I, I don't show here, but my uh, starting uh, uh, configuration is very uh, in line with uh, other uh, simulations is reasonable values. Uh, and then if I have uh, a fixed coefficients, uh, uh, marginal propensity to consume informally, 
So I have a, a lower the utilization rate, but not as much as when the coefficients are endogenous and respond. Because if you are adjusting downward, so they're, they're going to contribute to this uh, pressure downward. And here, the profit rate also. And then uh, I want to compare, yeah, and here also the um, uh, profit uh, share. It's also, so with no informal sector, the profit shares are a little higher. And when you have uh, informality, you have uh, uh, informal sector take a part of the output also. Uh, so it, uh, it's also uh, going to hurt a little bit the profits of capitalists. Uh, and then, yeah, with endogenous uh, coefficients, uh, the formalization share is even lower. Uh, so uh, investment as a share of GDP will also be lower, and the growth rate uh, also, of course. Uh, and then, uh, important to say, uh, we can uh, see these coefficients as uh, the endogenous one. We want to, to compare the uh, counter-cyclical and pro-cyclical uh, case. Uh, when it's pro-cyclical, uh, it's very dependent on uh, the initial uh, parameters. Um, yes, because uh, the initial parameters, uh, yeah, affect the uh, where you're starting, so affecting how fast you adjust. Uh, so here, uh, what I'm doing, I'm giving a shock in the seventh period to the investment. Uh, so I'm hiking investment a bit. I think it was like 10 percentage points, something like this. Uh, so to see how adjustment goes from, from, uh, from there. Uh, and we see uh, if we have endogenous uh, coefficients, uh, it's a little lower, OK? Uh, but I, I wanted to compare. Maybe I should skip to that uh, because of that. Oh, here. I, uh, I wanted to compare the case where we have uh, pro-cyclical uh, gamma coefficients, so the marginal propensity to consume informally, and when we have counter-cyclical. So uh, if I give a positive shock in the counter-cyclical case, we never return to the original value. Uh, in the others, we do. Uh, but, but the uh, speed of adjustment is different, as you can see here. So yeah. But then uh, if we have the counter cyclical, if we have a positive shock to investment, we do not return. So there's a little hysteresis. Uh, and we can see here the pass of uh, adjustment. So uh, if I am adjusting, adjusting the gamma coefficient, the marginal propensity to consume informally. So this was the pass. It was uh, coming to this point, this resting point. And then we shock, it goes all the way over and comes back to more or less where it was heading to. But if the uh, gamma coefficients, they are counter-cyclical, so um, means like uh, when uh, economy is growing, uh, uh, maybe you, you, you cannot, uh, um, you, you do not respond, for instance, to the utilization rate because it's growing doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't mean you're going to uh, consume less like informally. Uh, so uh, you see the adjustment goes to a different path uh, and not, does not reach uh, where it um, uh, was supposed to be if there was no shock at all. So uh, this is a few insights we're gathering from uh, this um, this framework we have been developing also for other purposes. But we are interested now in expanding a little bit uh, this, particularly the equations that make uh, the the adjustment of the parameters, so the gamma parameters. We do not have very good reasons in the theoretical literature to uh, uh, to set up a function uh, this way or another to explore the little uh, few possibilities. But we're trying to uh, tie down to to like a narrower set of possibilities uh, because we think this even could play a role in the. Um, adjustment to a normal uh, degree of capacity utilization or something like this. So yeah, thank you. If you have questions, I'd be happy to take them. Uh, yeah. OK, thank you, Henrique. Um, João? Yeah, uh, it's very, very. Henrique, can you please uh, 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 go to your set of equations? For the long run growth here? Yeah, yeah, no, no, a, a bit before. 
Yeah, yeah. The, 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 when you introduce the the informal side, yeah, these these are all right. Okay. The question, the essential question here is the following: Is your gamma gamma parameter right? Because yeah. when you can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. All right. So let, let's think a little bit about what is informality. Informality happens when the labor market, the formal labor market, cannot absorb all labor supply. And why is that? This happens exactly because wages in the formal sector are well above the wages in the informal sector. Right? Yeah, that's one, one of the perspectives, yeah. Uh, no, no, the, this is the main perspective uh, on, on our developing theories, right? And uh, one of the explanations, what lies behind this wage differential is something that is missing in the paper, right? Which is the following. Uh, wages come from productivity of labor. Even if you don't accept the, the neoclassical equality, that is a relation between wages and productivity of labor, mm -hmm. right? And productivity of labor generally is attached to skills. That is basically uh, 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 the underlying wage differential is based on a uh, 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 skew differential between informal and formal workers, right? So, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Go ahead. I don't think that would be uncontroversial, but go on, I'm, I'm following. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So if you, you, you can you follow the next, the next slide, please? All right. So no, 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 no. Uh, okay. Eleven, twelve. All right. Uh, equation eleven. So uh, equation eleven. Go back to seven nine. Just let me see seven and nine. You see seven is uh, you're you're saying the uh, uh, output of the informal sector equals to the uh, 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 the wages in informal sector, right? And nine, you are saying th this is the consumption of uh, right. So output equals consumption. So you solve this for the WI, all right? And you yes. get uh, 11, all right? So you, you, you have the output of the informal sector is a function of the formal sector, right? And uh, the weights are exactly these, these, uh, these uh, gammas, right? So if you think, if you just think about uh, when you, when you endogenize, with regards to 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 the to the wage differentials, right? When you have for the wage differentials, what you are going to have here is that the uh, the output for the informal sector may also depend on the 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 the, the, the uh, 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 may also depend on the uh, uh, wage of the informal sector. Right. So again, there is one thing that uh, I would like to to point out here in in, in this um, in this uh, approach is the fall. If you go a, a little bit more uh, further, all right. So now you have the profit share. Right. The profit share is. Uh, 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 you see, the equation fourteen depends on why. Y I Y F Y I and Y F depends on W I W F, right? And you are you are super, you are assuming that everything ends up as a function of W F. So W F <laughs> basically, but W F basically is the engine of your model. It's where the multiplier happens. Yes, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Exact. Yeah. So go, go ahead a little bit. I'm ju just doing. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Now, uh, yes, that, that 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 right. So, basically, what 
what the model is, it says the following. Everything depends on, on WF, right? And and uh, as you 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 and the UF go one 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 before one before one slide before, yeah. You and the UF also depend on WF because they depend on Y, right? Yes. So, so basically, what you have is, is 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 everything is a function of WF. Everything is a function of, of WF, and because okay. All right, that's that's the point that it, it, it needs to be really understood and discussed because you see where WF comes from and where the uh, the wage differential comes from, right? It is there is in this model no way of catching up. And let me tell you why this is a crucial question. When you come from the literature on entrepreneurship, particularly entrepreneurship in the third world countries, poor countries, and I went to the World Bank when George Thompson, I think, was one of the organizers of of these uh, of these uh, of these um, uh, workshops. What was uh, uh, an important point that was discussed there was the following. Uh, the informal sector in these underdeveloped countries, uh, they are formed by self-employed people. They have low skills, but they are self-employed. Being self-employed is a kind of necessity entrepreneurship. Necessity entrepreneurship, right? may entail some kind of learning about markets and some kind of real gains. Right? So what I'm saying to you is the following. You are assuming that WI depends on WF. WI doesn't depend on WF. WI may depend on exactly uh, entrepreneurship. All right? And therefore, there may be an internal mechanism that you are ignoring in which WI may catch up with uh, WF. And when the, uh, the wage differential goes down, it means that the, 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 the impact, the, all the results that you are obtaining, that formalization leads to greater profits and greater growth may not be achieved it's it's going to be the opposite because if you have more entrepreneurs in your economy and the entrepreneurs have enough freedom right to accumulate right to invest what the results that you are obtaining are reversed so this is the point that you see the the initial point that you need to to discuss is exactly that is that you, you are assuming that uh, the, the wage differential is kind of constant and second yeah. and second is that uh, you are ignoring uh, the origin of uh, the wages in the informal sector. If you develop, uh, if you think along the lines that I am suggesting here, your model will, is going to give you much more different, different uh, um, um, uh, numerical simulations, because basically what you are saying, if someone asks you right now, OK, uh, uh, Henrique, uh, uh, as a, a, a matter of, uh, of policy, economic policy, what is your policy prescription? And you say, oh, we need to increase uh, formality in the economy. But that's bullshit because formality exists either because of the skill differential or because there is some government uh, licensing laws that interfere with the mobility in the labor market. So basically, mm -hmm. it's 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 a it's a void policy prescription. You, if you say, "Oh, my model says we need to increase uh, formalization," yeah. So uh, someone is going to tell you, ask you, how? You don't have an answer for that in this model. You see, okay. I'm, I, 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 I appreciate everything that you do. Keep it. Now you, 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 you do the same model, thinking about the questions that I am suggesting you. 
And then you compare the, sim the numerical simulations. Because what you are, if you allow WI, WI to be dependent on something that is not in your model, which is uh, entrepreneurship, because uh, remember, informal sector is people that are self-employed and they don't have what? They don't pay taxes, so they are not registered. They have firms, but they don't, you know, they don't exist officially. But it doesn't mean that they, they okay. cannot grow. Okay, thank you for your comment. Uh, first of all, uh, on the labor productivity uh, and the skills, uh, the determination, uh, that does that is not my perspective here. Uh, here I'm saying that uh, this, 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 this expenditure in formal sector, so the demand for some kind of formal product, for some kind of informal product, uh, they'll determine the size of the, the informal output. And I had one version of this where I model uh, uh, work market, labor market, but not here. But when I do have model labor market, we can see the same workers with the same skill. They could be in the informal sector, they could be more or less productive depending on how demand uh, for informal product uh, varies, because sometimes it could uh, go up very fast. The informal sector, uh, in the, the theoretical literature, the empirical literature, they say, Always, it's very uh, flexible changes a lot, very unstable no? and very flexible also. That's why I made this assumption that we have no restriction. People are spending there uh, because they want to buy something cheaper and then uh, they produce output growth and the same workers, the same skills, they could be suddenly more productive. But I think it, uh, uh, what you bring could be very interesting, for instance, uh, some kind of, after a while, if I, I talk about uh, long run trend, so I could think about maybe a filtering down to the formal sector. If you're in formal firm for long enough and growth catch up, maybe you could filter to the informal sector. This thing could uh, this could be important also could uh, yield uh, different results. Yeah, let, let uh, me let me just yeah. uh, just uh, uh, I, I I I I fully understand what you are doing. All right, but I, 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 my criticism is not what you did. My criticism has more to do with the, the framework that was chosen. You know, I think that most of your results are kind of predetermined because of the bias towards uh, demand-oriented uh, 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 equilibrium. Let, let me just, uh, j j just to facilitate your life, there is a, a friend of mine that should be a friend of yours. Take an, his name. His name is Mauricio Parado. He did a master in, in economics in Brazil, and uh, he's now a professor in Copenhagen, Copenhagen Business School. Mauricio Prado, uh, right? He's a very nice guy. He's from he, he, he was from USP, did the the, the uh, master in Brazilia and did the PhD in in uh, in the Stockholm School of Economics. But Mauricio has two papers that you need to know. One paper is uh, published in the Economic Economic Review in 2011, called "Government Policy in the Formal and Informal Sectors." So again. For you to sell this paper, you need to answer exactly this crucial question is, OK, what what is what are the policy prescriptions of my model? Right. This is one thing. So this paper of Maurice will help you. Another thing, uh, another another paper of uh, Maurice that you, you need to, to read is that uh, publishing economics letters in 2014 called heterogeneous firms and the impact of government policy on welfare and informality, right? So uh, I, 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 I just leave this open to you because you need to address this very important uh, topic about this, this model, which is, all right, imagine that you are right. What is the policy prescription? The policy prescription uh, apparently is already there. The, it is like, oh, increase formalization. How? Yeah, because uh, that, that is the point of uh, the paper. This paper that was like um, to set up this framework, but uh, it's part of research agenda. And my main concern later is like um, 
government spending in a lot of ways, including transfers in welfare and a lot of manners, including transfers. And one thing I wanted to uh, arrive at the end later, not in, not here, uh, not with this, but uh, this was a step towards uh, that. Uh, some in some point, uh, informality could be a limitation to uh, it, 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 some kinds of transfers could uh, lead informality to grow. We have uh, uh, this is register for uh, some countries like Mexico, Colombia. Uh, that will have um, more informality because they're doing some kind of transfer program. And that was a concern. So I wanted to test some limits. That's why simulations. So that th these would be like uh, the policy uh, recommendation would be, okay, transfer, uh, tr uh, targeted focus transfers, but only so much. More than this, you could pressure, uh, you know, yeah. informality. Maybe it would go grow faster, maybe not. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but again, you see, uh, uh, there is, uh, uh, I, I teach, uh, 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 um, development economics, right? And there is a massive literature about uh, informality. And one of the things that uh, is more important about informality is that, well, these transfers don't need to be like a check. It can be education, it can be health, health care, right? It can be the rule of law. Right? Yeah, but they, and, uh, they, they, the impact on well-being is a little bit different. And that was my concern a little mm. bit because I'm um, the uh, study here at the Latin America Institute, uh, the Free University of Berlin, and, and, and they, they talk about universalization of public services and all of that. My question is, how much can we afford? And so uh, th that's why uh, I was thinking like in for, in for, growth of the informal sector could be one thing to restrain this, to, to, to uh, keep this in check. And also, uh, yeah, yeah, there, is, there are many pers there are far greater perspectives of, about informality. I'm taking one in particular. I, I, I saw you were taking a one a bit different, but I uh, think you uh, gave me some insights I could um, take home and then uh, probably incorporate as, as long as they go with this perspective I'm adopting. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, Joao. Joao. Uh, I have a brief comment and uh, so con congratulate your paper. It's a really interesting paper. Uh, it seems to me that it's based on our paper published in the Journal of Portuguese Economics with yes. Professor Jardinho. Uh, I, I, I didn't understand the difference between them. Uh, I, I saw that you spread the uh, informal sector into two different gammas, but uh, I did not understand the, the the main difference between this paper. That and one was until paper. here. That one was until here. That's one we, we had. Yeah. Okay, maybe we have the long the long run. Okay. Uh, and now I am uh, having a possibility how these parameters adjust. So that that's exactly the difference because there we had only the fixed case. So I'm yes. simulating here, yes, for the uh, endogenous and exogenous, and even with the endogenous, I have the procyclical and countercyclical. Oh, okay. okay. Because I'm exploring more how, because we 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 thought it like this. So there is one impact of this in the growth rate. Okay, and then uh, Professor Ricardo uh, said, okay, this could be important for an adjustment towards uh, some uh, normal level of utilization. So depending on how this parameter uh, reacts with, uh, within the, the cycle, the business cycle, you could change, you could alter the values of U, and if it's uh, sensitive enough, or if the informal sector is uh, big enough, so that's why it would depend on parameters, this could play a role in uh, bringing, uh, making these oscillations. So he was interested in exploring this more. So I, I um, moved, like, uh, developed the uh, theoretical framework a little further, and then I had to test a few yeah, possibilities. Yeah. Okay, okay. Very interesting. Uh... Thanks. Okay. Uh, if we don't have any further considerations about uh, Henrique's presentation, 
I would like to thank you all. Thank Henrique, thank João Faria, thank Beatriz, thank João Gabriel, and also George Thompson. Um, thank you.